Thank you very much, Daniel, for the uh, introduction. Um, um, good morning, and uh, I'm actually quite honoured to be here to be uh, addressing the topic of nerve sparing uh, surgery in cervical cancer. And uh, I'll be talking on the experience that I've had in Mika, uh, which is in Saba, and as well as uh, in Ampang, which is uh, the place I'm recently working with. So, um, yeah, I will divide the topic into the introductions of uh, radical hysterectomy and uh, nerve sparing radical hysterectomy and uh, the rationale of uh, performing nerve sparing radical hysterectomy in our setup. And it was initially initiated in uh, Sabah because of the, uh, the amount of cases that we do and the um, bulk of disease that we see in uh, Sabah. So I'm quite sure maybe it's going to agree with me that uh, the cases that we do and handle in Sabah is quite a uh, challenge. And uh, after that, I'll be talking about the anatomy of it in order to understand the uh, nerve in relation to the perineum that we are actually dissecting, and uh, the world literature regards to uh, nerve sparing uh, surgery, and uh, our experience in uh, Ikas, in Saba, as well as in Kampang uh, Hospital. So let's go to the research. As such, uh, we had found a grand place to be when I first came back from uh, Singapore for my fellowship training. And, uh, and that's where we actually uh, proceed to the red place that they needed. And as such, we do the Okabayashi technique, which is uh, a bit more radical in uh, relation to the tumors that we see on the average size of probably about 4 or 5 centimeters on the, on the, on the series that we actually went through. And as such, radical hysterectomy is associated with uh, severe bladder dysfunction as well as colorectal motility disorder. And this is the result of uh, nerve which is actually damaged in the process of doing the surgery, both the sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic nose that supply these four aids. And uh, that actually mounted to the uh, rationale of doing uh, embarking on nerve sparing radical hysterectomy. So because we have a significant amount of, uh, of uh, chronic bladder dysfunction that we actually see in, uh, in cases that we do, and as such, from the literature from Langdoni's paper, which was published in the Lancet in 2007, he actually uh, uh, has quoted a risk of a uh, bladder atomic risk of 30.7%. And as such, in Likas, the cases that we reviewed, the 41 cases that uh, we reviewed, uh, using the Okabayashi technique done from January 2008 to uh, June 2009, showed a bladder atomic risk of about 14.6%. And uh, therefore, uh, why is this so? Uh, what is it so different between uh, the surgery that we do and uh, why there is uh, that significant amount of uh, bladder dysfunction? So what happened here is uh, in a class two radical hysterectomy that we do, it actually amounted to a perineum excision, which is about half of the perineum before reaching the side wall. But in a class three radical hysterectomy. We, we actually excise the perineum right up to the pelvic side wall, both on the anterior as well as the posterior part, and together with the lateral part as well. And in this area from the uh, diagram that which is adapted from Sakura in the paper which is published in the International Journal of Gynae Oncology, uh, Gynae Cancer, we actually, we actually excise areas of uh, the quite thick area, the neutral sacral area, where we can actually potentially damage hypogastric nerves. We can actually potentially injure the pelvic side nerve, which actually carries the parasympathetic nerve supply to the bladder, and as well as the uh, vesicle axis or the vesicle branches to the bladder. And this is probably the reason why we have a significant amount of uh, bladder uh, toning as well as colorectal dysmotility uh, disorders. And as such, from the data from Landoni as well, which was uh, published in 2000, in a series of 243 patients, here we can see that the total uh, complication risk between those in the class 2 and class 3 is almost similar. But if you actually look into the neurological complication of it, you can see there are higher number of uh, uh, tonic planetaries in class 3 radical hysterectomy versus class 2 radical hysterectomy. And amounting to about 22% in class 3 radical hysterectomy and about 6% in uh, bladder tonic risk in uh, those which have undergone class 2 radical hysterectomy. And if you actually see the one with the uh, mean duration of time of waiting in a class 2 radical hysterectomy, the time is much shorter actually to resume back to normal bladder function. And as such, compared to the class 3 radical hysterectomy, the time duration is almost twice 
needed to actually resume back to like the normal like the function. And uh, I'm actually showing a few diagrams here what we do in our radical extracting. First and foremost, the space will be actually identified, the parallel cycle space and the parallel space. And between these two spaces, this dependent metrium. As such, in the class 2 radical extracting, we have size dependent metrium half, which is at this level, whereby the pelvic nerves are all being stacked from injury. However, if you actually embark on a class 3 radical hysterectomy, where we usually do, is the potential risk of getting the nerve injury is significantly higher. And as such, this perimetrium has the vascular component, which actually comprises of the uh, uterine vessels, and as well as the nervous component, which comprises of the pelvic nerves. And uh, we, in the uh, radical hysterectomy, uh, nerve stand radical hysterectomy, we try to actually spare the nervous component of it. And this is a, the one, this is the cases that we actually do in the core biomechanical technique. We actually clamp at the, at the lateral pelvic side wall, excise the perimeter right up to there, and actually potentially during the uh, nerves supply to the bladder as well as the rectum. And as such, after excising the uh, perimeter, there will be a free flow space between the power of the cycles, uh, spaces and the power rectal space. And as such, this is what we do in Sabah and currently in uh, Ampang as well. So, in the world literature, in regards to uh, nerve sparing uh, surgeries, it was initially being documented by Kobayashi in 1961, by Sakamoto in 1980, Hockel from Germany in 1998, Passover in 1999, Mass and Trembles in Netherlands in 2000, Kuwabara in 2000, Kato Muga. Murakami Yabuki in 2000-2003 and you can see a quite a lot of Japanese and power of surgery Kalu, that is Kalu from France in 2002 Aspatliesi in 2004 then back Japanese, Sakuragi 2005 and I actually uh, adopted this uh, technique from uh, Shingo Fuji in 2007-2008 So my uh, presentation is based on the uh, Shingo Fuji's uh, publication in Gaimian in 2008 in an atomic identification of nerve sparing radical hysterectomy and step by step approach here. What uh, Fuji or Shingo Fuji did was to identify the space again, but here, before actually embarking on to the perimeter, he actually identified all the vascular supply on the perimeter, which is the vascular component of it, identified the superficial uterine vein, subsequently the deep uterine vein. And this is the important structure that below the deep uterine vein that you actually see. The nervous component, which is the pelvic signing of coming through. And that is the, the nerve that you don't want to actually injure because it carries the parasympathetic supply, which actually carries the motor fibers to the, uh, to the organs like the bladder as well as the rectum. And as such, subsequently, uh, at the neutral sacral area in the Okabayashi space, after the second they return out, reach right down to a space here, uh, just lateral to the uh, neutral sacral ligament would be a hypogastric nerve that actually comes which carries the sympathetic fibers to the organs like the bladder as well as the rectum. And as such, the last important thing is the inferior hypogastric plexus supplying uh, branches to the bladder, to the uterus, and to nervous, as well as to the uh, to the uh, uh, the, uh, the, bladder, uh, the, the bowels as well. So discuss a bit of the experience that we had doing the nerve sparing medical instructive in in, uh, in the class as well as in Ampang. Um, so what happened here is the first technique is actually opening up para, uh, para rector and para recycle spaces. We actually uh, embark on doing the lymphadenectomy first before doing the radical surgery on the uterus because I feel that by doing uh, lymphadenectomy, pelvic lymphadenectomy, I actually clear off all the other anatomical structures easily and I actually visualize all these structures quite uh, easily. Subsequently, I will do the dissection on the ureter and uh, I try to go into the uh, Okabayashi space, the space between the neutral sacral ligament and actually lateral to it would be the identification of the hypogastric nerve then subsequently going for the perimetrium either on the lateral side anterior as well as the posterior and subsequently excavation of the whole uterus and removal of the whole specimen. So let's uh, go in uh, by picture. What you can see is the initial phase is to actually identify the paravacycle space as well as the paravacycle space and in between this is the perimetrium. And on top of it is the uh, uterine vessel cell. 
So after that, we actually proceeded with the pelvic lipidectomy. Um, this is a picture of a lipidectomy that we actually have performed. We utilize the femoral nerve external eye artery, external eye gluteal is on the left side, and the obturator space which the obturator was seen. And uh, later on, we actually uh, identified the uterine vessels and actually ligated the uterine actually at its origin and as a result, actually dissected the whole ureter out and going towards posteriorly, identified the hypogastric nerve in the Okabayashi space. And uh, this is whereby we actually dissected the natural perineum, which is the back. Um, you can see the uh, vascular component uh, as well as the nervous component. You can actually see one of the nerves which actually goes through and it's not quite clear here. With uh, the hypogastric nerve, which is lateral, immediately lateral to the uh, uterosacral ligament. So, this is uh, after the hysterectomy, whereby the uh, picture of all of the uh, picture that I have taken after pelvic nerve dissection and the radical hysterectomy. And uh, coming to the uh, pelvic nerve uh, that can be actually visualized with the hypogastric nerve and the pelvic spinal nerve, which is in the base of the floor of the uh, pelvis. So occasionally, uh, that we, we do proceed with a uh, paraiotic nerve dissection, paraiotic lymph nose dissection. Uh, there is a lot of controversy in terms of its uh, significance here, but uh, in certain cases of uh, suspicious node that actually be palpated over the uh, pelvic area and uh, some enlarged nodes down the pelvic area, we do embark on going up and assess the paraiotic area and occasionally that do see somehow of 1 to 1.5 centimeter nodes, we proceed to a systematic paraiotic lymph nodes dissection. Here, we actually dissected the whole pa uh, paraiotic nodes clearly, thereby we identified the inferior vena cava, and then we, this is a pre space with the common, uh, common uh, IDEC base going into the inferior vena cava, that is the inferior eccentric artery, and in the, this uh, classification of a lymph nodes uh, uh, dissection in uh, in uh, the Miss Kalu and Moro's uh, publication in 2008, we actually classified the uh, lymph node dissection into class 1, which is only into the pelvis, up to the level of the bifurcation of the common uh, common iliac artery, that is class 1, class 2 is right up to the bifurcation of the common iliac vessels, class 3 is right up to the uh, inferior mesenteric artery, and class 4 is right up to the left of the nerve so occasionally we do a part of this surgery to actually remove and it is also in the publication by Hacker that actually it does help in those uh, uh, in terms of uh, outcome in terms of those which actually has not healing those. So this is a specimen that we actually remove. The whole uh, procedure here is to actually have a good vaginal cuff, a good uh, perineutral margin and uh, in order to actually offer a, a potential cure but trying to reduce the mobility of a bladder, chronic bladder dysfunction as well as a colorectal disorder, disorder motility disorder. And uh, from the data that we actually collected from our experience in Picasso as well as in Ampang, so I actually divided it into from uh, the initial presentation that we actually had a poster presentation in the uh, OGSM in 2009 and also a publication in the Malaysian Journal of OMG in June supplementary. So we have four cases, a series of four cases that we operated on in December 2007 right up to that, uh, May 2008 collection of uh, four cases and uh, most of them, uh, all of them are 1B1 disease. And it was in Ampang, uh, after I was transferred to transfer care in the month of uh, August, we embarked on the no steroid radical hysterectomy from the month of October uh, 2009 up to uh, December 2010 and we have a series of 10 cases and uh, most of them are between uh, fetal stage 1B1 and uh, 1B2. So uh, the one that we actually published uh, here was during the uh, OGSM. Uh, this is our unpublished data at the present moment. So our mean operating time is about uh, uh, range of uh, about, uh, six, five hours here. And uh, the initial phase of doing the surgery in the cars, we have a longer duration, which, uh, which ranges a uh, mean time of about seven hours. And that is the learning curve that we actually have. And our mean blood loss is uh, less than 500 uh, cc and our number of lymph nodes salvage ranges from 22 to 45 lymph nodes and the mean nodes are about 31.2 and 
and uh, the reason why we have a day time post uh, operative uh, to do the uh, letter training is because the majority of my patients have day time post off to come back for good inspection. At the same time, we actually uh, we, they would have an individual catheter inside them. We will actually letter train them at the present moment. So at day ten, we see them. We have a ready period of less than 100 uh, meals after letter training in about 35.7% of cases. And those which actually have less than 50 cc is about only 7.1% uh, in those which actually day 10 post operative. And then about day 15, majority of them would have actually regained normal better function. And it's only one series of cases that we operated in Saba. She actually had a complication of pelvic abscess, abscess during that time. And uh, she underwent another opportunity to actually clear off the abscess with drains and everything. And uh, the, 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 the catheter was kept for quite a while before that she actually ambulated. And subsequently, she resumed optimal bladder function at week 13 after that. So, this is an, uh, uh, one case that we actually has um, mobility. And my conclusion here is uh, not sparing surgery has the uh, potential ability to improve uh, post surgical better function and therefore subsequently reduce the risk of uh, uh, improved quality of life for that patient. Long term outcome is still uh, needed to be monitored because we need to, to look and follow them up in terms of survival and especially so those which actually have uh, histology showing perineural invasion because we do not find any uh, data with regards to this uh, prognostic factor that we are looking in regards to perineural invasion. So therefore, we need a long-term data to actually look at that and that is something that we need to look into. So thank you very much for your time and uh, attention.